Donald Trump became president in part because of the forces that Charles Murray was putting his finger on and coming apart. You're going to relegate him to the margins because he dared to ask a question about intelligence and class structure in American life, of which only one small part of the uh, big compendium had to do with race, and now he's a racist and he's a white supremacist. You know nothing, anti-intellectual thugs. Mm. I mean, the people who want to shut up a discussion about this question and who want to make it a sign of your decency and your legitimacy for membership in society to castigate and ostracize Charles Murray, which I am not going to do. Those people are a threat to civilization, in my opinion. Yeah, although I, there is one aspect of this which I'm a little conflicted about because I, I don't know where to draw the line here. Hello out there. Uh, this is Glenn Lowry, The Glenn Show at uh, uh, Substack.com forward slash Glenn Show. And at uh, YouTube, I'm with Sam Harris, uh, noted author, neuroscientist and philosopher, uh, a podcast behemoth uh, with, uh, what are you calling it, Sam, Waking Up? Uh, uh, or the, making the sense. podcast is Making Sense, yeah. Uh, the meditation making app sense is Waking Up. With Sam Harris. Author of many books, I've got a list here. Free Will, Lying, The Moral Landscape, The End of Faith, Letters to a Christian Nation. So, I mean, you, you've got quite a, quite a resume there, Sam. I really appreciate you coming on the show. I've uh, spoken with you once before for your podcast, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. It's been five yeah. or six years. Uh, but, uh, uh, thanks for doing this. Oh, happy to do it. Yeah. You are one of my gurus on, on, uh, the, the topics we touched on my podcast. You, you have my proxy. I just default to, to your views on questions of race and, uh, moral confusion publicly around issues of race in our society. So, uh, thanks for all that you do. It's been great to, well, to be a student. Thanks, of Thanks, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't default to my views, should you? I mean, that. From a kind well, of it, for, at a, at a, it, as a proxy for actually thinking everything through from first principles, I, 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 I've now seen enough to know that I probably agree with you on uh, on these topics. And uh, you and obviously the, the rest of the team, um, John McWhorter and uh, Coleman and Camille, and uh, there, there are many people who um, are having a similar conversation. And, and not to say that you guys are all uh, in agreement on all the fine points, but it's just uh, I, I've become a student of all of you. So, Thomas Chatterton Williams, would you include yeah. him in that bunch? Oh yeah, he's great. Chloe Valdery. Uh, yeah. We are all black. Uh, these uh, people that you're calling attention to. Yeah, and and I, I, mean, I consider it a a perversion of our um, social discourse that that is relevant, but unfortunately, it is all too relevant. You know, I mean, it's, it's just you can say things and you, you need to say things that uh, I can't easily say or, I, you know, I will pay a slightly different price or, or, or a drastically different price for saying them. And um, not to say you don't pay any price. I know you have, but it's um, the fact that you're the color of your skin is relevant to the conversation is why the conversation is so necessary because it, it really shouldn't be. And if we were in a saner world. You wouldn't feel any special need to touch the issue of race based on your identity. So. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and you know, it's not over yet. We're 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 fighting for making it a better world, a world more like the one that you envision. We don't live in that world at the present time. I would note uh, there's a difference to be drawn between the principle it shouldn't matter and the fact it does matter and in view of the fact that it matters that has implications i suppose for how we conduct ourselves we avoid certain issues or take certain risk i mean i can take risk in my classes for example teaching you know i can i can say things that i think if my uh one of my colleagues one of my white colleagues were to say them uh they they might get into trouble i mean my friend Amy Wax, the law professor at the University of Pennsylvania, is in trouble now because of some things she said here 
uh, at mm. the Glenn Show uh, raising questions about immigration or affirmative action policy. And I don't necessarily agree with everything she says, although I do agree with some of the things that she says. But she said things like, if you have lower standards for admitting black kids, then the kids you admit are not going to do on average as well as the kids that you didn't lower the standards to admit. This, this is just logic. Yeah, that's fairly logical. Yeah. If the standards actually correlate with the performance of the students whom you admit, which if they don't, why would you be using them as standards? Right. I'm talking about like admissions tests. And if you use a lower score for admitting some kids than others, then because it's a statistical necessity that on the average, you're going to predict those kids to do less well on the average, not one each one individually. Uh, and uh, she says stuff, stuff like that. And it's in a... <laughs> Her dean has now written a letter to the faculty, bringing her up on charges for uh, engaging in activity in the classroom contrary to uh, the values of the university. And uh, I say this in my classes every day, and uh, no one has come around yet with a hook to pull me off stage. Yeah, I, I'm, I honestly don't know what I believe about affirmative action. I mean, I, I think, you know, to first approximation, I think, uh, at one point, it was absolutely necessary, and it was obviously a a, uh, a lever that could be pulled to right a moral wrong and a, and a social ill. Um, but I think now we're at a point where it's creating its own negative effects, such that I mean, you know, to, to name only one, it's it requires obvious racism against Asians at this moment to to be enacted. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what I think. I, I think it is you know, it's problematic for a lot of reasons. Some of which you just cited, based on what Amy said. Um, I mean, I think the most insidious aspect to it is that I, I can envision occasions where it would seem to justify something that looks like racism. You know, e even though it's it would be motivated differently. I'm I'm, I'm thinking of a case where. I mean, for instance, if it could be established, I, I believe it might have been established that um, the medical field, you know, various medical fields have, have practiced such affirmative action that you could reliably expect that the people in those jobs, you know, the, the cardiologists or the brain surgeons uh, of color had less stringent requirements applied to them to get into those positions. Right. If that is in fact true, I mean, I know people like Charles Murray have argued that it is true. Um, you know, you get a, you get one chance to have brain surgery, you know, on yourself or on your kid, right? And so, how enthusiastic should you be to have a black brain surgeon if you know that, you know, the the MCATs for black doctors are a standard deviation lower or whatever whatever it is, right? I mean, you know, those, I know Charles Murray has has delved rather deeply uh, and dangerously into facts of that kind in his latest book. If in fact that were true, and it, you, you would expect it to be true if affirmative action really has been widely practiced there, um, that's a really insidious and perverse outcome. The last thing I would want would be to be confronted with the choice between two surgeons uh, for a very, you know, for a, you know, potentially life-saving and a, you know, or you know, life-jeopardizing surgery, and to have my main criteria be in deciding between them, the color of their skin. I mean, that's not the world I want to live in, and that's potentially a world we have engineered through good intentions, right? And so that that you know, that's something that that's one example. I mean, there are many examples where you know the stakes aren't that high, and we don't care, and it's much it's much it's in fact rational to care about the social good of diversity, say, but you know, brain surgery is not one of them, right? And um, uh, you know, as it's a you powerful know, example, you know, and pervert, you know, you know, it, it, the analogously, you know, but on the other side of the coin, athletics is not one of them. You know, I don't see anyone arguing that we need more Jews in the hundred meter dash at the Olympics, right? Um, and there are no Jews alleging anti-Semitism for, for the fact that Jews are not well represented 
you know, on the podium yeah, at the Olympics. They're, they're going to uh, dismiss this kind of argument. I, I, I think there's nothing logically wrong with what you're saying. They're going to say, you know, who plays basketball or who plays uh, soccer is not really important, but who gets to do brain surgery or more generally gets access mm -hmm. to the medical profession is important. They're going to claim that uh, there's some studies, they're probably not going to be particularly impressive studies that show that uh, black patients do better when they have black doctors, et cetera. They're going to they're gonna, uh, deny the relevance of the admission standard that was employed for the medical student to the judgment about the uh, proficiency of the brain surgeon, arguing that there are many, 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 many other filters between medical school admission and actually being in the operating theater. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're going to uh, dare you to do the statistical inference that you're just doing. I mean, gosh, if they're using lower standards to admit blacks and if my brain surgeon could be white or black, it's my choice. Why would I ever choose a black brain surgeon just based on the statistics? They're going to call that kind of profiling uh, to be a, a, a normative uh, fault, you know, like a police officer who behaves differently when he stops a car with a young black kid in the vehicle than he does with an older white woman in terms of the kids reaching for the glove compartment. Do I or do I not take that to be an aggressive act? So that's what they're going to say. Yeah, yeah, well, I wish some of that were valid. Um, but I have one thing to point out is that, that whites are not at the top of the heap there when you're, when you're doing this sort of profiling for surgeons. I mean, I think you, you know, by this logic, you should prefer an Asian surgeon at this point, knowing what they're- By a wide margin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, if the Asian yeah. kid gets into medical school, she must have been literally uh, off the charts. Superstar, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, the, so that, but this is, you know, I would argue this is not the world we want to live in, but I don't know how to get to the world we want to live in. Right. Well, I, I have an answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, develop the historically underrepresented group's performance such that it is comparable or at least closer to that which is exhibited by other groups and accept the reality that uh, not all groups are going to perform every activity at the same frequency as they mm -hmm. are represented in the population. That's a silly criterion of uh, justice. Yeah. Uh, if you want there to be more black brain surgeons, then uh, let's get more black kids doing biochemistry at a high level when they're juniors or sophomores in uh, college, and which means let's getting more black kids doing high school chemistry and biology in the advanced placement uh, level that some of the other kids are doing it, and accept that if blacks are twelve percent of the population, it's okay if blacks are seven percent of the brain surgeons and eighteen percent of the whatever the flip side is. Uh, so I think that's what you, yeah, I mean, yeah, those yeah. things well, are I not could, entirely beyond our, our reach. I don't think if we could get people to swallow that pill all at once, I think it would be, uh, all to the good. I, I do, I do think that is the, the framing that is, um, so morally confusing here. The idea that every walk of life that is desirable to be walking in requires a, um, a a representation of the population that is you know perfectly in register with the the general population right so that if you have less than 12 or 13 percent African Americans in any desirable walk of life that is a problem uh, you know just on its face and very likely explained by the the ambient levels of racism that that, that persist in that walk of life I think that's, I mean, what the, the second claim is obviously false. And I think the first claim is also, as you just argued, needs to, needs to give because um, it's just, whatever the explanation, whether it's cultural, biological, accidental, it, it's just not rational to expect that every group will show the precisely the same proclivity and aptitude for everything that is good to be involved in, in the theater of human events. Frankly, frankly, I think it's a logical contradiction. I mean, I, I think it's demonstrably wrong. So the identitarians, the people who are talking about how many of this group and that group, they, they take groupness seriously. They think this thing, race, actually matters for some reason or another. 
They think ethnicity and ethnic identity, I identify as a this or a that. So if these things are real, these uh, differences between groups are actually constitutive of something meaningful, different, embracing different visions about ways of life, different interests, different practices and patterns, different culture, different beliefs, different expectations, different habits. How can it be but that they would re reproduce themselves to some degree in uh, the different allocation of time, the different investments in various kinds of development and, and so on, which would then be reflected in different uh, occupations and, uh, and engagement. I wouldn't expect them all to be in the same industries. I wouldn't expect them all to be doing the same thing. Some of them are going to be small shopkeepers more frequently than other groups are going to be. Some of them are going to be academics more frequently than other groups. Are be. Some of them are going to be athletes and entertainers more frequently than in other groups are going to be because groupness ends up being expressed in terms of what people do with their time and how they live their lives. So then I think groupness matters. I'm prepared to fall on my sword to make sure that the black kid feels comfortable as a black kid in college. But then I expect that everybody's going to be uh, in medical school, law school, uh, in finance at the same rate uh, as they are in the population. I, I just think that's a logical contradiction. Yeah. You weren't serious about identity if you expected to see uh, a, a mere proportionate uh, expression of, of the uh, various members of the identity groups in every human endeavor. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point. If diversity matters because there are actually differences that matter between groups, well, then you'd, express, yeah. you'd expect those differences to have some expression that, <laughs> that leads to different you know, differences. So uh, you, can't really, you can't really have it both ways there. Now, you mentioned Charles Murray, and uh, you said uh, whether it's cultural or biological or whatever, and I'm aware of your big debate with Ezra Klein, was it, uh, some years ago about uh, yeah. Murray and yeah. all of that stuff. Uh, you got it. You, you taken any of it back, or are you still still holding out for whatever you were holding out for? Tell me what you were holding out for. Well, I, I, was, not, I uh, was not holding out for any uh, positive part of his thesis, apart from the necessity of being able to talk about these things without being branded a racist when it's obvious that yes. you're not a racist, right? That's, that was the, the, the hill I was prepared to die on, right? It's not, to, I mean, I, I have, the truth is I have as, as close to zero interest in racial differences in anything as I think you can have. Right, I just I'm just not interested in the topic. What I, I am interested in is the the silencing effect of of the perception that if you um, violate uh, any one of a number of incre increasing number of taboos erected on the left and by our our, uh, our most prestigious institutions, journalistically and academically, you risk. Um, defenestration, right? So, so when Charles Murray stands up, you know, 25 years after he wrote his infamous book, which I hadn't read yeah. at the time because I was, had been convinced by all the bad PR that this was just racist, uh, uh, you know, moral pollution, essentially. Um, when he stands up 25 years after having written that, having written many other books in the interim on different topics yeah. at, at Middlebury, and gets deplatformed uh, semi-violently, you know, such that his yeah. his host gets a concussion, I think, or a neck injury. I think um, it was a neck injury. Yeah, I I perceive a, a a real problem there that I wanted to talk about, and and so in in the course of talking about it, you know, we spoke about his actual thesis, which again is is routinely misrepresented. I mean, it's when you when right. you look at the most controversial paragraph in the Bell Curve, which I then I then went and read. To, Advance of I have read the him. bell curve cover to cover. Yeah, I mean, the, so the worst paragraph in there is a paragraph where he and Hernstein say, we don't know what contribution ra uh, biology and environment make to these differences. Um, it seems rational to assume that both are involved. You know, I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing. They are resolutely agnostic. Excuse yeah. me for interrupting, but the but, words are important. They're resolutely agnostic. Yeah, but we and if you if you interpret us to have 
have made the claim that one or the other accounts for the whole story, you have misunderstood us, right? Um, you know, we just don't know. Uh, and for that, he has, um, he has really, he has been burnt as a witch, you know, figuratively speaking, but reputationally, it has been the case, you know, repeatedly for a quarter of a century. Um, I, I, I just find that to be, uh, you know, I mean, obviously there are many other cases of people touching far less uh, uh, radioactive topics uh, where now, you know, the, we just we're seeing the cancellation of people, and so I, I, he was he I, I perceived you know in, in hindsight to be a kind of canary in the coal mine, and um, so anyway I, I had him on my podcast, and that that proved to be every bit as controversial as I had reason to fear it would be. I mean I, I did after I did, what book? Excuse me what, again for interrupting. After what book did you have him on your on your podcast? It was it wasn't actually in reference to a book. I don't know that I don't know when he had published his last book. I think he probably the book before had been coming apart. Yeah, um, okay. It was before human diversity. Uh, is, right. Is it was really before human I'm, diversity, mm-hmm. and uh, um, yeah, and it, yeah, and so I, I did pay quite a reputational price for even having that conversation with him and giving him as much. Um, you know, aid and comfort as I did on, in that podcast, but I, I viewed it as a, you know, as morally important to do because it, it just seemed insane what was happening at that point around him and, and around everyone. I mean, J.K. Rowling and anyone else who's getting uh, pilloried for for having said something deemed uh, you know blasphemous. Mary Mary is a special case. We actually, I actually teach the Murray case in my course on free inquiry in the modern world. Mm-hmm at Brown, where I'm, you know, resolutely not agnostic about the issue of whether or not you should be able to investigate such questions. Of course you should. What are we doing putting our heads in the sand? If we, and uh, what are we doing to science, uh, which is the foundation of our civilization, if we are, I mean, it's a kind of corruption of our intellectual life to foreclose the discussion of important questions based on evidence. Mary doesn't have to be right or wrong about that, but Clearly, the question doesn't answer itself. It's not a priori obvious what the answer to the question is. Question being, to what extent does biogenetic inheritance influence the expression of intellectual ability as measured by cognitive ability tests in modern society? That's a hard question. It's an important question. You get to ask that question. That's not a moral question. That's a question of cause and effect uh, and so on. And what manner of uh, society will we have become if not only asking the question is forbidden, but defending the asking of the question mm-hmm. is forbidden. I mean, like right here, right now, I'm black. Everybody expects me to give a certain speech, and I'm not giving that speech. That speech is Charles Mary, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, is a white supremacist. That speech is that the line from Charles Mary to Jarrett Taylor is a short, straight line. Jarrett Taylor being American yeah. Renaissance guy and he's a white supremacist and you know he jared taylor is jared taylor he gets to have his views too i don't have to agree with them for him to be able to have his views too but that's a separate question uh charles murray losing ground was probably the most important book about social policy written in the second half of the 20th century it was published Mm -hmm. in 1984 it was murray's first big book and uh, it shaped the discussion about welfare policy to a very significant extent, especially on the right, but also in the center left. Uh, the Welfare Reform Acts of 1996 uh, uh, that Bill Clinton signed into law were substantially influenced by the work of Charles Murray in that critical assessment of the impact of the great society, social policy on inequality in America. That's the author of Losing Ground. Coming apart, I, coming apart is a very, very prescient. I mean, Robert Putnam, the very esteemed and distinguished Harvard political scientist, mm. basically is following in his book, Our Kids, is basically following in Charles Murray's footsteps, pointing out that uh, there's an opioid epidemic coming and there are deaths of despair right around the corner. And we had better pay attention to the separation and quality of life between uh, class straight amongst white people in this yeah. country or else mm. we're going to miss the boat. Donald Trump became president in part because of the forces that Charles Murray was putting his finger on and coming apart. You're going to relegate him to uh, uh, the the margins because he dared to ask a question about intelligence and class structure 
uh, in American life, of which only one small part of the uh, big compendium had to do with race. And now he's a racist and he's a white supremacist. You know nothing anti-intellectual intellectual thugs. I mean, the people who want to shut up a discussion about this question uh, and who want to make it a uh, sign of your decency and your legitimacy for membership in society to uh, castigate and, and, and uh, uh, ostracize Charles Murray, which I am not going to do. Those people are a threat to civilization, in my opinion. Yeah, although I, there is one aspect of this which I'm a little conflicted about because I, I don't know where to draw the line here. I, mean, I don't even know where the, to draw the line with respect to Murray. I don't know well. I mean, my only conversation with him, I believe, is, was, was on that podcast. And I certainly don't think he's, he's a racist, but I do question why he has given so much attention to this issue, right? This is the one question I asked him in my podcast, which I felt like I didn't get a satisfactory answer to. It's like, why, why go there? Or, or why go there this much, right? And I could imagine- Let me ask you a question, Sam. Uh -huh. what? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I just want to know why he has to have an answer to that question. Why an investigator has to justify to anybody why they're investigating some, because that's ad hominem. When you ask him why, it's as if you suspect that his motives are somehow impure, and his motives have nothing to do with the validity of his uh, uh, statements about the question. You may say that you're not interested in the question, but whether or not why he's interested, I don't understand how that's pertinent. Well, because I, I just think that you can make a larger argument here, and you need to make a larger argument, or at least assume you're on the right side of this argument. when. Uh, thinking through the, the social consequences or just the, the, the sheer consequences of finding out certain facts, right? So I, I just, I think there's certain forms of knowledge that are, are, that, that are in fact dangerous and are best not sought, right? Or, or certainly best, and if sought, best not published widely. And I mean, so one case, my most recent podcast is actually on this topic. It's the topic about which I've, I've had my mind uh, fundamentally change you know that it, it used to be that um i believed and up until a couple of weeks ago that so-called virus hunting was an intrinsically good thing right you send the virologists out into various caves and you get them to sample the, you know, the viromes of, of the, the assembled bats and then you uh by doing this discover new pathogens that may pose uh, pandemic risk and you know, it seems like it's a good thing to, you know, just on a, by assumption, it seems like a good thing to know in advance what might be coming for us and to, to be able to prepare ourselves better for it. But in light of current technology, it seems like a patently insane thing to do. First of all, it's, it's patently insane to, to then publish the genomes of these pathogens online, open source this project to the, to the world. Because what you're then doing is you're because putting because of bioterrorism. Yeah, you're putting into the minds of, of fully at this point some tens of thousands, probably thirty thousand at this moment, and the number is only increasing. You're putting putting into the minds of thirty thousand people who are competent to build these pathogens, is to just synthesize them on their own, you know, at, effectively at home, right? So you're putting a lot of st store in the in the mental health of you know thirty thousand. Uh, you know, biochemists and molecular biologists and, you know, the, the people who have relevant training, knowing that only 1% of these people are very likely to be insane, right? Or, you know, and probably another 1% are, 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 are sufficiently open to being captured by, uh, you know, some kind of ideology that would put them somewhere on the spectrum of, of being a, a concern there. Why do any of this? Uh, let me, but, but, let but me I just ask a, I don't want to go too far. I, I want to ask you a question about... Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question about the, bi the virology thing. Uh, are you saying don't sequence the genome, or are you saying keep that information closely held, don't publish it? Well, well in this case, don't even do the work, because now we know we can create uh, vaccines in 24 hours once we get a genome. Right? So like, at most, you're saving yourself 24 hours, you know, 23 hours in being able to to, to do this, having sequenced this in advance, right? Um, it just doesn't make any sense operationally to, you know, you're not getting ahead of anything, really, uh, when you do this. And for, you're, for that application of the sequencing, you're not getting ahead of anything. Right. For the vaccine development application of the yeah. sequencing, 
But how, I, think I mean, this is my pro this is my problem with trying to regulate this kind of activity at all. It presupposes a state of knowledge which doesn't exist in the absence of actually carrying out the investigation. You're, you're going to regulate whether or not to do an investigation, the fruit of which might be massively developmentally helpful to humanity, well, as well as well, admitting I, I, of the risk yeah. that you, you identify. No, but I, you can't I think, know that, that without actually having done the investigation. Well, no, no. I mean, also, at this point, oh, on this COVID. particular topic, I think we, we know that the risk is very high to publish this information, and the upside is very low if, if, if non-existent, right? So, um, again, absent some other argument, I guess I could be swayed back in the other direction, I'm sure, by, by a further argument about all of the benefits that it would accrue to knowing this stuff in, in advance. Well, let's just assume- Which I'm not competent to provide. For, but let's just assume for argument's sake that that, that, that doesn't exist in this case, right? So we, we have a clear case of there's, there's massive downside to publishing certain facts widely or even seeking those facts in the first place. And there's very little upside. Um, I wonder whether in the case of, you know, doing a deep dive on, you know, intellectual differences between various groups, um, we're on similar ground. Like why do why seek this knowledge? What are we going to do with the knowledge, and why seek it? Now, I I, I agree that we may be ambushed. Let me interrupt by again. Let, anyway. let me interrupt again, Seth. Go for Excuse it. me. Yeah. No, no. I, I mean, the primary question is not about groups. The primary question is about individuals. The mm -hmm. the, the group question seems to me only to be a derivative or a second order question that arises once once you've undertaken the primary investigations, which is understanding the foundations of human intelligence and its distribution in populations. So I don't know how you uh, police the investigation of the uh, determinants of, of human intelligence so as to avoid the uh, politically uh, disquieting uh, group comparative uh, undertaking. I mean, it just seems I mean, and that's precisely my problem with this kind of uh, moral management of scientific inquiry. I mean, it, it presumes a kind of kind of omniscience. Well, just do you think it might be possible that it would be better if we didn't have group level data on on all of these differences, and we just had individual data, right? So, like, no, no one ever. We never took an inventory of what race you were or ethnic background you were. And we still, you know, obviously you, you, every individual went through, had to jump through all these hoops academically to get wherever they get. But at the end of the day, we weren't in a position to say, oh, we just looked at the MCAS scores for blacks and Asians. And yeah. it turns out that there's, you know, a vast gulf between them. Um, what do you want to do with that factoid? Well, here's, I, I know what Charles Murray's answer to your question is, and I think it would be mine as well. Sure, we can do that as long as you promise that we don't have a politics driven by the inequality and in the representation of groups in these various activities. Mm. I tell you what, you, you give up your racial justice uh, uh, weapon where it, whenever the number of doctors that who are black is low or the number of people who are promoted to partner at a law firm is low who are black or the number of people who get into the Bronx High School of Science is low, you give that up and you stop collecting those statistics. And I'm happy to do away with investigating group disparity in the, uh, you know, determinants of human behavior that actually influence whether or not people excel at the at these activities. It seems to me you can't do one without the other. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's again, I'm I'm open to argument on this point, but the world I think I want to live in is where race and other differences between groups has but has the moral and political status of hair color currently. Right, so we just simply don't have the data on how many blondes got into Harvard last year, and nor would anyone think to have that data. Right, we don't want the data. Nobody cares. Um, how do we get there with respect to skin color uh, and religion and anything else? Right, that's where I would. That's where I think I would want to be, and in uh, that, I mean, the path open to us there is to cease to pay attention to these variables. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and, and I agree. I mean, I guess I would have to, given what's gone on so far. I mean, if I told uh, you, if I told I, you we were going to, 
there was a group of people who wanted to add hair color as a to the list of concerns differentiating groups right if there was a if there was a big political movement around uh how many you know let's find out how many redheads are currently employed at fortune Hair color eye color yeah yeah and we we're, we're now really going to work it we've convinced ourselves that we now need to care about these variables too right that would seem like a perverse misuse of moral intelligence right and it just would well, be, I, 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 why add that it, to our it could be coming. I mean, people, body size, you know, obesity, uh, the cultural preference for certain kinds of ideal types. So the beautiful woman is the woman who's uh, got blue eyes and blonde hair and whatnot. If, if we looked into the market for um, eggs, you know, human eggs that uh, people are going to do in vitro fertilization and whatnot are purchasing. I, I don't know this for a fact, but I bet a lot that there's a premium driven by these kinds of, uh, you know, characteristics like how tall was the woman? Was she blonde or brunette? Was she white or black or Asian? Were her eyes blue or, or brown or whatever? I'll, mm -hmm. I'll bet people actually pay a premium in that market for certain traits. And so an investigator might want to know whether or not uh, employment or success in the business world or number of people come out to your movie or whatever turns on that. And then they might end up wanting to collect that data. Yeah. I just, yeah, I think we have, we're right to have an intuition that more of that sort of thing would be Isn't regressive. That? Yeah. And so, so then why not set our sights on less and less and less and finally none at all so that, because it would seem, it would seem insane to ask the question, wait a minute, just how many blondes did get into Harvard last year, right? Like, just that, like, it, 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 like who, who are you that you could possibly care, right? Like, what, who's going to get out of bed tomorrow morning with that moral and political project, right? I, how do we get there with respect to race? That's, that's the, the, the riddle I think we need to solve. But the, the, the first impediment to solving that riddle are all the people who think it is, it would be, um, it's just politically inadmissible to even have that as a goal, right? They, they don't even aspire to get to some kind of race blind utopia, right? They're like they're, it's not even, that wouldn't even be utopia. That would be a bad outcome on their account. And the people who feel this way are, you know, on the far right, real racists, you know, what real white supremacists who say that, you know, the, 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 the moral differences and political differences between people are in fact indelible and are right to be drawn at the skin. Um, and the people on the far left who, the, you know, the far left identitarians who think that it really matters what race you are. I mean, these people have to either be convinced or, or overruled uh, right and left. And that, that's, you know, that's a massive political project. Let me see if I can imagine what they're thinking, because I don't, I agree with you that we should be in a world where we, where these things are given less credence. They're thinking about history. First of all, they suspect the person who invites this move. They think you're trying to change the subject. They want justice. They, they think that the racial disparities to which they will attend by doing the kind of bean counting that you and I might wish they wouldn't do, those disparities are a reflection of structures of domination and devaluation and whatnot. And, and they want justice. And they think that your effort to call the whole thing off, we, we had race for a few centuries. Uh, as the West came out of Europe and conquered the world, we had race. As we did a colonial thing and a slavery thing and whatnot, we had race. And now we get to the 21st century, we want to call the whole thing off. And they're saying, no, no, not, not so quick. Uh, my bean counting is really in the service of, an, of a larger accountancy, a moral accountancy, uh, which can't even be uh, uh, broached, let, let alone resolved without attention to the things you're telling me to disattend. Well, that, that might be true in certain cases. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm, I consider myself confused around questions of affirmative action, right? Like, the, where are the places in our society where affirmative action still makes a lot of sense and is, in fact, necessary? And where are the places where it's obviously counterproductive? I mean, that, that you know, the, the devil is in the details there. And I'm open to argument on in any specific case, and, and there's certainly places in our society where I think we're right to worry that 
something like structural racism is in fact true and problematic and you know it needs to be dismantled and then there are cases where we've obviously flipped it and there's a structural racism that's working to the advantage of black and brown people and to the disadvantage of Asians certainly and white and um and this is this may be a controversial claim it may be a a blasphemous one but i think it's probably true certainly approximately true at this moment that any truly desirable high status place in american culture now is um is more easily gotten to for um people black and, and, and brown people <laughs> Provided the provided the equivalent uh, uh, yeah. uh, qualifications, which is to say that if so, if you you know if you if you are getting great grades and you get you have great test scores and you're black, there is no door barred to you yeah. in this in this society. And in fact, every door is wide open to you. Every every door that you should want to you would want to go through. You know, that you take the top twenty percent of any corner of culture, whether it's journalism. Academia, you know, science, media, you know, Hollywood, but just any place that you'd want to be, yeah. where you you would where high status would accrue to you for being there. It is easier, not harder, if you're black at this moment. I would make that claim, and it, maybe there's some exception somewhere, but it's not. It's not at the Oscars. It's not. It's not in a writer's room in in in, in comedy in Hollywood. It's not. Um, it's certainly yeah, not at it. Princeton, you know, and so no, it's not. where is it? Uh, it's not at a law firm. And it, it's not in medical school. It's not when you're running for office, right. uh, et cetera. So, uh, so no, don't, uh, don't worry. I, I'm not the least bit offended, although I can imagine a lot of people will be offended. It sounds like that's not the first time you've made that declaration though, Sam. No, no, I've made that on my, on my podcast at least once. And, um, but it's, so, so what do we do with that? It. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, right? I, what I'm saying is, lying about that is a bad thing. Driving people crazy with those lies is a bad. Well, thing. Well, we tell the truth. What, yeah. what we do is we tell the truth. I want to say one final thing about affirmative action. Then I want to talk to you about God for a, a little bit. Sure. Um, it's undignified for black people to be reliant upon special dispensation in order to be included into the most valued venues in society as a permanent way of doing business uh, going forward. That's not equality. That's, that's being, uh, being a ward. That's being a client. You're being taken care of. You're being covered for. Mm. Uh, I don't know how anybody with self-respect could be happy living in such a world. I think the corruption of the soul here attendant to accepting special dispensation as if it were your right because of something that happened, not to you, not even to your parents, something that happened to your ancestors long since gone. You buy into a narrative of permanent injury and then you walk around with your hand out expecting to be treated specially, afforded a special privilege as an entitlement and you call that equality, that's not equality. So quite apart from, I think, the legitimate concerns that you raise about the dilemma of what brain surgeon to choose or about the fact of favorable, not uh, disfavorable discrimination is the norm in many venues of American society. There's something profoundly wrongheaded for black people here mm -hmm. about settling for affirmative action. But what about a t using it as a tie, using race as a tiebreaker in cases of equally qualified people? It, 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 assuming uh, diversity okay, is, is, is intrinsically good, or that you know it's, it's, it's sane for an institution like Harvard to want a, 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 as much of a representation of American society as they can get whilst keeping their standards high, why not use race as I a tiebreaker? I think that's an easy case to which I can say yes, but I don't think it's very helpful because that happens almost never. Mm. Right. I mean, tiebreaker is an event of uh, equal qualification. The event of measure zero is the way the technicians would put it. It, it. You know, smooth distributions. I'm drawing at random. I've got two people. What's the likelihood that they're going to come out exactly the same? That's a low probability event. Right. But it's fine as far as it goes. I mean, you know, uh, 
I, I, I'm not talking about administrative practice or how to admit kids to uh, college. I'm talking about politics. I'm talking about the large narrative of what is racial justice and, and what is equality. And, and I'm saying, uh, I think, and this is my view, I've developed it in some of my own writing, development is the key, performance is the key, ability, mastery is the key, preference, uh, it's, it's uh, so 1970s. You know, I say the world is fast moving and it's changing, the Chinese are coming. Uh, nothing is standing still. Black people don't want to be in the position of being wards of uh, 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 pitying uh, liberal establishment who think they are virtue signaling and standing on the right side of history by looking at the other way at our mediocrity. We want to be players, real players. We want to be like the Jews. Mm. Well, actually, What's wrong with that? There's another point here, another moral paradox or parent paradox, which um, I'm sure this is probably a point you've made before. I think I heard Coleman make it uh, the first time I heard this, uh, but um, Coleman Hughes, yeah, uh, who uh, despite his uh, his age, I have learned a lot from him. Um, talk about a precocious uh, young man, um, but he's a brilliant kid, no doubt. Yeah, as you know, I understand you're a big booster of his. Yeah, yeah, um, but so he made the point that if affirmative action is good, and it's you know, is and then morally necessary. Why do we have to treat it as as a um, as something that is um, ignominious when when uh, actually pointed out? Right? Why couldn't they? Why you know? Why wouldn't we point point to the students on a, on our campuses who are affirmative action ad admittances and and celebrate them as you know the the you know, Test cases that are that are correcting this moral wrong, right? It, like Indeed. it's obvious. It's obvious that you that, that it just just doesn't run through to do that because no one, as you say, wants to be someone who got into their station for reasons other than their merits, right? And that's um, and obviously we do. Actually, we don't have a yeah. Go ahead. No, I was to say ironically, it's it's actually I think worse than that in a way. No one wants to be, you got to Yale Law School because of affirmative action. On the other hand, having gotten to Yale Law School, graduated and uh, uh, risen to the federal bench, you might be heard to say, I'm a beneficiary of affirmative action and I'm proud of it. So, mm -hmm. so people don't want anyone else to point out that they are beneficiaries of affirmative action, but then in defense of affirmative own. action, are qu quite prepared to crow about having been boosted by affirmative action. So the, the, the discourse is just entirely dishonest mm. uh, around, around these issues, I think. Can we talk about God for a minute? Is, is belief in God irrational? Well, it depends what you mean by God. I mean, you know, there's something you could mean by that, which I think is entirely rational. But if you're talking about a personal God, a, a sectarian God, you know, the God of Abraham as opposed to some other God, you know, and, and maybe some specific uh, Construal of the God of Abraham and anything else is is anathema and likely to send a person to hell. And then once you start adding layers of doctrine onto the claim, then I think it becomes irrational and and untenable. And I, I think we I think we've lost the right to our our provincialism uh, on that front. I just think it's we know we know too much about the world. We know too much about how these books came into our possession. Uh, we know too much about um, uh, the, the the merely human origin of the texts that tell us that every word between these covers uh, is inerrant for all time and cannot be edited by human hand. Um, and uh, we know that we have just too many of these books, each claiming to be the sole word of the creator of the universe. And so therefore, I mean, this is the point that Bertrand Russell made, um, the comic effect, you know, that just just, just by, by the sheer numbers of religions that, that claim to be the you know, sole no one of truth, them could be true. you know that you, you, every, every believer, even if you are a believer, you have to expect damnation purely on probabilistic ground. I mean, we just, there's, there's more than five of these things. You know, and, and each claim that everyone God? else is going to hell. 
you say a specific tradition which makes very strong claims like Christianity or Judaism or Islam. Uh, you don't, you don't, you don't want to take these texts as infallible or whatever. So that notion of God you would reject on grounds of rationality, but what would the thin version of God that you might think acceptable to a rational contemporary person look like? Uh, well, so if you want to say, as I would, uh, that uh, consciousness, you know, that in you which is that makes your being in this world uh, something to consider in the first place, right? The, the, the thing that adds value to anything, right? The experiential part of the, of the cosmos that is resident in you at this moment, right? Um, this is something we don't understand. You know, this is, this, it, obviously we don't, we don't, we haven't explained this yet. We don't know how it's arising and in, in, therefore, you know, integrated in the physics of things. We don't even, in the end, we don't even know that it is arising on the basis of the physics of things. Uh, that's not something we can say about the mind, but I, I think that is something we can still say about consciousness. So consciousness is a mystery and a miracle, and it's the most important thing, right? And um, I'm not saying, you know, as a matter of science, we, should, we shouldn't seek to explain it, but I think that there's good reason to wonder whether we will ever explain it. And there, there's, there's certainly good reason to think that any explanation will, in fact, not be deflationary, right? I mean, even if we, even if we perfectly explain consciousness in the end, we understand exactly how it's arising on the basis of information processing in complex systems like brains, say. And we know what the necessary and sufficient conditions of it are. It is still the thing that matters. Right, it is still the, the 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 source of all beauty and all moral goodness and all apprehensions of truth, and it can be explored on its own side. It can only be explored on its own side, experientially, in in contemplation, in meditation, with psychedelics. You know, I mean, like like the the the, the good stuff of life is on the is on the first person side, right? The experience. Hold, on, hold on a minute. Yeah. I, I just want to, I don't want to get lost here. Sure. What is, what is consciousness now? I mean, literally, uh, is it well, self-awareness? What, what, when does the complex system, which is our, it, it, our it's brain. The, it's the fact that the lights are on at all, right? So I, I, self-awareness is an added capacity within consciousness, but it's the fact that there's something that is like to be you in this moment. It's a fact that you're, it's the fact that, that the lights are on, that there's, there's a qualitative character to experience. And there's not, you know, it need not be, need not have been the case, right? You know, we, you know, given what we think we know at this moment about the brain, it seems that not every aspect of our minds have this character, right? That the brain is doing a lot that does not seem to be, uh, experienced consciously by any part of the mind right now this this is for example it's regulation of our breathing and the beating of our heart and so on yeah and, and even stuff that is closer to what we can consciously apprehend in each moment I mean, so for instance i i'm speaking now i can't consciously inspect how i'm following the rules of english grammar insofar as i'm able to do that and i can't consciously inspect my failures to do that i i'm i'm just witnessing this product of unconscious information processing. I don't know how I get but to the that, end of the sentence, right? And when I fail to get to the but, end of the but sentence, but that you I have a sense of you. Excuse me again. Yeah. You're speaking, but you're not, as it were, aware of exactly how it is that your brain is causing you to speak. But you're you're doing it nonetheless. But the, there's a there's a you who is aware of the fact that this is happening somehow and and that's the mysterious dimension of being the the lights are on that you're referring to again this is a question yeah but i, I wouldn't put it i wouldn't a lot turns on what you mean by by you there because i do think the self as it is generally perceived is a is an illusion right and i think self-transcendence 
is the is the actual core of of our religious concerns, right? It's the experiential core. It's it's what made Jesus Jesus, right? If Jesus, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know who the historical Jesus actually was, but assuming he existed more or less as described in the Bible, um, and the same with Buddha and any other matriarch or patriarch of a you know our, our great religions, the 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 aspect of human experience that they were testifying to that made them interesting enough to gather around and form religions uh, upon relates to qualities like self-transcendence and unconditional love. And they have the far end of the distribution of, of positive human psychology, which is rarely, all too rarely experienced by us, but still experienced by millions and millions of people, if only in moments. And there are ways to experience it more and more, right? And this is the the valid ground of our spiritual concern, right? Personally and and collectively and intellectually, right? I think we should want to understand this scientifically, but personally, I think we should all want to experience more and more of this good stuff before we die, right? I mean, that's what is the point of life? What is the point of of having more years on this earth together. Like what 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 is the missed if you die today, what is the missed opportunity of tomorrow? It And you propose that the answer to that question is experience? The ex- experience of love and self-transcendence and the depth of your being in you know that the, the, the cosmos is illuminated where you stand. Right? It it is the, it is what it's like to be you and what it's potentially like to be you when you really get your head screwed on straight, right? When you're no you longer- think self-transcendence is an illusion? I, I, I really am trying to understand. No, no, self, self-transcendence is real. The self that is transcended is an illusion. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, the, the self is generally, uh, the, the uh-huh. cramped self of, of you, know, you know, otherwise known as the ego, right? The, 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 the petty self, the fearful self, the self that feels confined in each, and, and, and reducible to, in each moment, the stream of discursive thought, right? That the voice in your head that feels like you in each moment, that is what is to be penetrated by uh, any you know, valid form of spiritual inquiry, right? I mean, when you're talking, ab- when you're talking about, and this is back to your question about you know, God and, and the validity of, of religion, the baby in the bathwater that we should not want to throw out is this range of positive human experience that is what it is it is it is the the experiential fact around which every religion is crystallized right it's why we have religion in the first place the reason why you have a jesus right who was so charismatic as to get people to make you know vast sacrifices to, to live by the lights of his message and the and the way you have for, for thousands of years, uh, some number of, of Christian contemplatives who've had deep experience trying to, to be more and more like Jesus. And the way you have a Meister Eckhart, say, is, be, is that it is possible to have fundamental insights into the nature of your mind that, that are transformative. That it, it's possible to be very different than you were yesterday based on something you can do with your attention, right? It's possible to not suffer the way you used to suffer over ridiculous things, right? It's possible for you not to feel divided okay. from, from, from the world and from nature and from other people in the way that you tend to feel divided when you're just lost in, in self-directed self-talk. And, that, and so I think, I think all of that is valid and more than valid. I think that's the most important project in life. Um, and it is traditionally it has only been given a religious framing. I just think we at, at this point in our history, and for and for probably a hundred years this has been true, we have to recognize that what what is being testified to there is not the unique divinity of any one God or the u- unique veracity of any one religious tradition as organized by uh, specific literature. It's that there is a universal uh, there, there, there are universal facts about the human mind 
that need to be understood in general, universalizable, non-sectarian terms, very much in the terms of 21st century science. But again, the 21st century science that explores this can't discount the first person side of these questions because it's the, the, the answer at the back of the book of nature is not going to be you're just a bag of chemicals and you know love is okay. just a certain complement of neurotransmitters. Yeah, they're, clear, they're, clearly, I'm in your wheelhouse here. It. Yeah. And, and our time is limited. Maybe we can yeah. have another conversation. I don't oh, know, always. Sam, would yeah. you be willing to have another conversation? I'd really like to... Uh, I mean, here I am, uh, a uh, lapsed Christian who uh, was baptized at the age of 40, who was deeply immersed in an African-American, uh, charismatic, uh, fundamentalist congregation. I mean, not cultish, but, you know, uh, very traditionally uh, religious. And, let's, and I have thrown all that o o over. But I still found meaning in the prayer, the ritual, the community, the, uh, the, the practices of that, of that faith. That, that meaning felt very real to me. And it was outside of myself. It wasn't just experiential. It, it, it wasn't only about my mind. It, it, it was somehow being a part of the flow, uh, being integrated into a web of mutually believing people. There was a community. There was something, as I say meaningful there and i don't i don't see any room for that at all in the vision that you just sketched well well no there's definitely room but you so you're you're asking to add to the baby in the bathwater the variable of community and organizing beliefs and ritual and i and i would i would grant you that all of that is very powerful and, and for many people necessary and i think we we suffer a deficit of it in secular society, right? But I, but I would argue that we, what we need are non-embarrassing, non-divisive, non, and therefore non-sectarian and non-dogmatic approaches to community building and ritual and awe and profundity. And I, mean, I think I, we, we want all of the good stuff. We want good, we want beautiful buildings in which to gather for high purposes, right? Now, it just so happens that the only bill, the only architecture currently devoted to, the, to that stuff at the moment is specifically denominational, right? The only people who could raise enough money to build yeah. a beautiful building in the middle of Manhattan are the religious dogmatists, you know, are the Christians and Jews and Muslims uh, who got those buildings built, right? So now you're now if you're a secular group wanting to meet for purely rational, secular, but it, but nevertheless ennobling reasons on a Sunday, you have to figure out which church you're going to rent. Otherwise, you're going to wind up in a bad hotel banquet room, right? You know, it's just like, so the question is, what does the, a 21st century temple of wisdom look like? And who will, who's going to build it, right? And how do you, what songs do you sing that aren't embarrassing in terms of their intellectual content but then also aren't embarrassing for their you know having be, been totally denuded of beauty because you know bad secular writers got their hands on them right and you know created bad songs right so it, it, it it's a hard problem to solve culturally okay, and we so haven't that. solved it but i just think i do think we have to recognize that sectarianism real sectarianism in the 21st century doesn't make any intellectual or moral sense. We're going to let that be the last word in my Christian believing friends out there yeah. are going to be okay. mad at me, but take comfort <laughs> yeah. that part yeah. two, part two is coming just like they say on Easter Sunday. Right. <laughs> Good yeah. Friday was part one. Easter is part two. Part two in this conversation is coming. We'll arrange that, Sam. Thanks a lot, Sam sure. Harris, extraordinary neuroscientist and philosopher and best selling writer and podcaster. Uh, who came on the Glenn Show, for which I'm grateful. Happy to do it. Thanks, Thanks for all you do, Glenn.